I want to start by pulling up a few of the things that Dennis had mentioned about the, the work that we had done on bringing Vernadsky into the consciousness of Americans, of people around the world. The anthology that 21st Century Science and Technology produced for the 150th birthday of Vladimir Vernadsky was published in two parts, uh, volume one on the biosphere, uh, volume two on the noosphere. We published an original translation from one of the works that Vernadsky published in French, uh, The Study of Life and the New Physics by Megan Ogden, Ney Roulard. And um, I'm going to use some of that as the basis for what I'd like to talk about today, which is the there exists a profound coherence between the economic and scientific ideas presented by Lyndon LaRouche and the concepts of biosphere and noosphere as developed by Vernadsky, the great Russian scientist of Ukrainian heritage, who is the subject of our conference today. This connection is of incredible importance for countering the Malthusian green suicide cult and for charting a course towards economic growth to completely eliminate poverty on this planet and increase economic output by an order of magnitude globally. Lyndon LaRouche, he speaks of the source of value in an economy as lying not in money, but also not in physical production itself. The source of economic value is the ability of human beings, of the human mind, to create discoveries of universal principle and implement those discoveries socially to achieve an increase in our power over nature. This is measured in an increase in what we would call carrying capacity if we were animals, but which we can better call, following LaRouche, our potential population density. How many people can be supported in a certain area of land as a function of our level of scientific and social development? Economic advance is also measured in an increase in the density of application of energy in human economy, what LaRouche calls energy flux density. Now, to see the parallels between these two thinkers, Lyndon LaRouche and Vladimir Vernadsky, let's consider the distinctions that Vernadsky made between three phase spaces the abiotic, the biological, and the cognitive, the noosphere. So these are phase spaces that include their own proper principles. The biosphere, if we look at it, it is not only living matter itself, currently living matter, it extends into the crust of the earth to the limits of the atmosphere by virtue of the action that life has taken to change the chemical composition of the lithosphere. The noosphere, the human race and our reshaping of the earth and beyond. Biology has had an increasingly powerful impact on the lithosphere, and human cognition has grown even more profoundly to have an increasingly powerful impact on both. And although, unlike Vernonsky, many today assume that biology must be nothing more than physics, and that human cognition is at its foundation a biological and therefore a physical process, this reductionist approach has not been demonstrated. It hasn't been proven. It hasn't been shown to be true. It's simply an axiom, a tenet of faith. Eventually, we can explain human thought by biology and physics. Eventually, we'll understand all of life purely through chemistry. It's an assumption. Is it true? Now, I'd say biology follows laws of physics, but without being fully explained by them. Music, it's conveyed using notes, but it's not contained within them. Music is not composed of notes. An idea, you convey it with words, but the words are not the idea. The process of initial discovery and of communication with others through dialogue is inseparable from knowledge itself, from the idea. Cognition occurs in a biological substrate, our nervous system, and it's affected by that biology, but it is not only biological. A couple of examples in contrasting human creativity with machine learning. There is a oneness of conception in a human hypothesis that is not found in the millions of parameters in a machine learning model. We hypothesize causes which have an existence that is really opposite to a correlation of data, of sense impressions. Human thought is not logical. It cannot be performed by a computer. 
So to draw out the differences among Vernadsky's phase spaces, the abiotic, the biological, and the noetic, I'll focus in the rest of this presentation on one particular aspect, the nature of time in those phase spaces, with particular emphasis on the arrow of time. Why does time flow in one direction and not the other? So to get into that, let me start with a similar analogous example in geometry, something that Vernadsky also looked into the difference between left and right. In Euclidean geometry, there's no directly statable difference between left and right. They're simply opposites. So unless you refer to some specific object and you say, you know, the heart's on the left side of your body, you've got a, you know, a freckle on your right hand, you cannot distinguish left and right, except that left is not right, right is not left, but you can't say what one of them is on its own. Try it, try defining left and, you know, and see, see what you come up with. This was something that Vernadsky wondered about because in biological space, there are profound differences between left and right. Many molecules exist in both mirror images of each other into, as two enantiomers, stereoisomers. Amino acids, I think with one exception, are chiral molecules this way. They exist in mirror image forms, but we only see one in life. Left and right are different. Vernonsky wanted to find a form of geometry capable of comprehending this difference. He reached out to mathematicians and geometers to work on this. But let me ask, what if abiotic geometry simply cannot fully comprehend biological geometry? What if there are truly biological principles that come to bear in this area that we cannot derive or build up from from the abiotic? So from that geometrical analogy, let's come back to time to look at past and future as we looked at right and left. In the abiotic world, the dynamic laws of physics, they have no direction in time. Time passes, but the formulas work the same way if you move to the future or the past. If you have a differential expression that helps you understand the evolution of a physical system, it doesn't matter whether dt is positive or negative. You can run your projections forward or back, either predicting the future path of a pendulum or recreating what must have been its past motion. There's no difference. But there do exist thermodynamic laws of physics that do have a direction in time. That time is related to what is called entropy, a measure of the amount of energy unable to do work, or sometimes called, although I wouldn't recommend it, a measure of disorder. This arises, for example, in the flow of heat from higher to lower temperatures. So if I played a video of obviously a fast motion video of planets orbiting a star, you wouldn't know from looking at the video if I'm playing a video that's going forward or backward. The planets could have moved either way. But if I show you a video of a cup of tea in which an ice cube forms while the liquid gets hotter and hotter, hotter and starts to steam more and more, you'd say, well, the video is being played backward. Unlike the video of the planets or the a pendulum or the equivalence of left and right in geometry, heat related process clearly has only one direction in time. So briefly, the idea of entropy is that over time, states move, systems move towards states with more ways of being. There are more ways to arrange our molecules in our cup of tea, more states for a warm cup of tea then there are states for a hot cup of tea with an ice cube. There are more ways to have air spread around in a room than there are ways of having it all condensed in a bottle in the corner of the room. If you open a compressed air tank, the air will escape, but it never goes back into the tank on mass, even though that wouldn't violate the dynamic laws of physics. So now let's take a look at biology. In biology, there are several different types of time. So you can think about the different scales of metabolic time. You know, think of time over a few hours. You eat food, you move your body, you excrete waste, you breathe out carbon dioxide. That's one kind of time. Over generational reproductive time, you have a different scale. Over evolutionary time, tens of millions of years, we have another scale. The direction is clear. Over generational reproductive time, trees as a group can move across a landscape even though an individual tree doesn't walk in metabolic time. 
And over evolutionary time, life doesn't just change. It's not just different. It changes in a specific way. It advances. This can be measured in the number of elements used by life. This can be measured by the flow of material and energy through life. And Vernonsky considered this a biological principle. As an example, if we look per body mass per lifespan, mammals, on average, use much more energy than reptiles. Mammals have additional specialized processes made possible by our endothermy, our controlled temperature. A process of cephalization has seen a concentration of nervous processes in the head, including the brain. This is a direction of evolutionary time. And unlike in abiotic thermodynamic processes where the arrow of time points towards states of greater probability, in evolutionary time, the arrow moves towards states of impossibility, not greater probability, but improbability, of new biological technologies that simply did not exist before at all. Chemotrophs, living off of sulfur compounds emitted by hot vents in the ocean floor, you know, the original forms of life, they can't photosynthesize. But with the development of photosynthesis, we now have an atmosphere that is one-fifth oxygen, a huge change. Photosynthesis caused immense changes in the atmosphere, the crust, the oceans. For these changes in life, past and future are not just opposites, like left and right in Euclidean space, or a positive or a negative dt in dynamical physics. For life, the future reaches states that the past could not have. So now, how about cognitive time? For us, think through the completely different experience that you have personally with the concepts of past and future. And now, can you remember the future? Can you change the past? What is now for you in your experience? How does now differ from any other moment in time, from any then? In fact, do rocks have a now? Do dogs? If there weren't people expressing our free will, how would any then differ from the now? Does a rock know the difference between now and 10 minutes ago? Without cognition, does such a difference even exist? Is there a now, a present, without us? What differentiates now from any other then, if not free will, from the difference between what we can affect and what we can't? Is now an aspect of time that exists only in the noosphere? Fundamental differences. So let's take a look at biology, cognition, and economics. Life has become increasingly independent of its surroundings, such as using the distant sun for energy through photosynthesis, rather than chemicals in its immediate environment. Life has increasingly shaped its surroundings, such as the atmosphere. Human beings bring into being new synthetic environments through the infrastructure platforms that we create, which LaRouche discussed in the introduction to this conference. This is how he saw economic infrastructure, not as a collection of pieces of rail and roadway, but as representing a certain level of technological understanding and social direction. An economic platform changes the physical space in which economic processes unfold. It creates an environment, like, take the analogy, the endothermic environment of mammals, in which new economic processes are possible. And unlike all other life, unlike change over evolutionary time, we create these epochal changes in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when a fundamental discovery is born or communicated. We embody in our minds a process that takes the mere biosphere millions of years. We are endowed with a now that allows us to change the future and also the past by drawing meaning from it. And this process of change is the truest substance of the universe. In improving our economic abilities by increasing our power over nature, we use more energy, more resources per person, and that is good. We also create more resources per person. We create energy. The laws of thermodynamics do not apply to human economy as a whole. It is an abiotic principle. 
So let me conclude. We have a role as the only known form of cognitive life in this universe to expand that process of development initiated by the abiotic universe, the formation of the solar system, the development of the biosphere to create a more prosperous, joyful, beautiful, purposeful human society. And such efforts will bring a measure of justice to the past and the future of the lives of Lyndon LaRouche and Vladimir Vernadsky among the billions of people who have lived and are yet to be born. Anti-entropy, growth, is our mission. I'd like to conclude by reading the last few paragraphs of uh, my article, which appears in the upcoming or just posted issue of Leonora by the Schiller Institute, Vernadsky and Time, Time for Humanity. I wrote at the end of this, Nicholas of Cusa maintained the primacy of the process of discovery itself whereby contradictions drive the mind to hypothesize a new concept not derivable from the past, a conclusion that defies the premises rather than following from them. Kuza held that it was through this process of knowing through specific ignorance that one could come the closest to seeing God. Resolving paradoxes through developing new metaphors for understanding is more than a technique for arriving at physical truths. This process is the truest substance of nature. Every human being is born with the potential to apply this process of discovery, to exist in the efficient immortality of discovering principles, applying them for the betterment of society, where that betterment is seen in increasing the capability of fellow human beings to participate joyfully in this most characteristically human of endeavors. The creation of such a society, free, from the oligarchism that currently threatens global thermonuclear warfare is the most beautiful, the most human, and the most urgently pressing task facing mankind today.